So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, webinar today that uh, Lactinet has put uh, put together for you. Um, so I'm Jeremy Tenhag, and I work uh, with Lactinet and uh, work in the area of herd management software and 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 herd management and how do we make use of software and information to make better decisions on farms. So that's that in a nutshell is my role in, in at Lactinet, and it kind of fits well with this presentation today, actually. And also with us today is Dr. Ewan Ferguson, who is well known to many in the industry. And, and Ewan is a semi-retired, and that might be up for debate whether that is true or not. But Ewan seems to be always busy with something, but a semi-retired dairy veterinarian. He's, uh, Ewan's uh, based out of the central part of Ontario. And uh, uh, we'll certainly be focusing a little bit more on the Ontario region today based on um, kind of where we are today. So, um, you know, we're going to look at how production levels uh, have compared between the years 2019 and 2020, just to give some general comparison sake what, uh, what has been happening this past year. We'll present some, some really interesting findings, I think, on key production metrics for the year 2020. And... Uh, again, for Canada, but also regionally. And then we'll also share a bit of an, I don't know if it's a novel approach. I'm not sure if that's totally fair to say, but I think it's a bit of a different approach to describe, you know, what is a high producing herd in Canada or, or regionally, you know, different regions of the country. What, what does a high producing herd look like? And um, that'll make a lot more sense as we, as we go through our presentation today as to what we mean by that. We'll get right to it here. So, the basis of our presentation today was comes out of a, a data mining exercise or project that we we've, we've been working on through the winter, uh, you know, this this early 2021, and where we're looking at production data for the year 2020. And we did a similar exercise for the year 2019 a year ago, and it was it was quite a bit smaller in scope. Um, so we we had some experience as to how we're going to get the data, but so in this data set we're talking mostly about today, you know, it involves a lot of test day records. It involves a lot of herds across the country. And there's test day measures, there's lactation measures. We'll get into that shortly. And we've also uh, broken it down, you know, what are the numbers for Canadi Canadian herds on milk recording? Certainly you and I are, are, are tremendously grateful and really appreciated all the huge uh, help and assistance we got from Karen Hand and Dr. Dave Kelton, uh, who, who are part of uh, the University of Guelph um, in town here. So, you know, quickly, you know, we just summarize some, some test day measures. We're going to, you know, just do a quick comparison of the year 2019 and 2020. You know, there's numbers broken out by lactation group and by region. We're looking at differences in 305 milk. We're looking at how does milking frequency impact this production, you know, for 2019 and 2020. Okay. And we're looking at, you know, the, the middle, what's the middle or what's the average or the 50th percentile for each of these years and just how does it compare? So here's a, you know, a, a, a table, lots of numbers on here. Um, don't want to get too bogged down in the specific specifics of the numbers, but you can see on the sort of the kind of the more the left hand side of the table, there's Canadian numbers and then there's some regional numbers to the to the to the right of that broken down by parity and herd as a whole. And these, you know, general production measures that I think a lot of us talk about a lot of us, you know, focus on when we want to understand how is our herd doing. Right. And, and a lot of the focus whenever we're trying to measure success on farm at the end of the day comes down to, you know, productivity and production numbers. OK. And um, so these are the numbers for the 50th percentile. All right. And we'll talk about some specifics here in a second here. We've got a few more numbers where we looking at peak milk linear score mature equivalent milk, again, by, by overall herd and by parity, by, and also by region. You know, some of the interesting, you know, uh, points out of this table, you know, for example, um, looking at linear score, uh, you know, at a herd level, we, we like to see linear score on average being below three. 
certainly at the herd level across Canada, all like in all regions, uh, certainly below three. But when you look at the older cows, it maybe isn't a huge surprise that we're hovering right around that linear score of three mark. Um, certainly as well with 305 mature equivalent milk. So mature equivalents, you know, it allows us to compare um, lactation group to lactation group. So we're, it, it helps with trying to define comparing apples to apples really as it, as it relates to 305 milk. And you'll notice that second lactation animals are the highest of this group of the, of the three parities there. Probably again, not a huge surprise I think the pattern is the same, whether it's 2019 or 2020. Think of the lactation two animals as being your lactation one all-stars. So, you know, they're good. You know, they're going to have some selection. You're going to select the best of the first lactation animals the previous year. So it kind of makes sense that they might be highest. And certainly lactation one animals just based on genetic progress is going to be higher in, in many cases compared to our older cows or mature cows in the herd. So that kind of resonates and it kind of makes sense. You know, if we look at year to year comparisons for milk per cow per day, right? So 6,800 uh, Canadian herds and um, at the 50th percentile, there's very, very little difference. I think it, there's a point, you know, a point one or a point three difference between uh, 2019, 2020. Similar patterns across parities. Okay, so that's for Canadian herds. Ontario herds, uh, it's, it's the same sort of pattern, almost identical from year over year. You know, like, you know, at a herd level, I think uh, it's 32.9 for 2019 and 32.8 for uh, 2020. And again, the lactation groups are very similar. There might be a bit of a, a, a slightly bigger, small decrease for lactation uh, three plus cattle. Uh, uh, in Ontario, but really it's, it's, it's virtually the same year over year. So I think it, I think it helps to, to, to see that it kind of validates the process of putting the data together. I don't think we would have expected there to be humongous decreases from year to year. Um, again, if we look at fat per cow per day, we're going to see the same sort of pattern um, there might be a little bit more of a decrease in 2020 compared to 2019. You know, I think it's 1.31 uh, kilos of fat per cow per day versus 1.29 in 2020. So very similar. Um, and again, similar patterns uh, across parities really for Ontario. So 305 milks, if we compare 2019 to 2020, at the herd level, there's a slight increase in 2020. And that slight increase is similar across parities as well. And you'll notice the gray bar is slightly higher than the blue bar. And you might be wondering, well, how is that possible if milk was a little wee bit down in 2020, kilo of fat a little bit down in 2020, how could 305 milk then be up slightly in 2020? Doesn't make, uh, at first blush, maybe doesn't make a lot of sense. And, you know, one of, I think this sort of helps describe this a little bit, quite a bit, actually, the milk per cow per day, fat per cow per day, linear score, those measures are test day measures based solely on activity in 2020. So those numbers come from 60,000 plus test days, you know, from 6,800 plus herds in Canada. Um, as you can, so those are test day measures, activity in 2020 only, versus the lactation measures, which involve completed records in 2020 from 6,800 herds. Okay, so it's the same group of herds, but these are completed records in 2020. So some of the data that goes into completed records in 2020 would have spilled back into 2019, and I think that's going to explain why there might be a slight. Uh, a difference in those measures for us. So, you know, if we look at milking frequency and how does that, you know, how is there any differences from one year to the next as it relates to, you know, 2X herds versus 3X herds versus robotic milking herds? Again, the numbers are extremely um, similar. Uh, we, you know, 
for sure, we would like to point out, um, you know, 3X herds, there seemed to be a, a, a slightly bigger decrease in 2020. Um, you know, the, the whys, you know, we don't, um, you know, there, there'll be lots of factors that I think could influence that, I suppose. Um, certainly the numbers are quite similar and that's Canadian herds. This would be Ontario herds. Um, and again, the numbers are extremely similar. And even for the three X herds in Ontario, those numbers are basically the same. So um, a lot of similarities in production from one year to the next. So I'm gonna let you and take over now and he's gonna go into some more details on the 2020 data. Good, thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jeremy's done a great job of comparing the 2019 to the 2020 data. Uh, so now at this point, we wanna start focusing on the 2020 data. And we're gonna look at eight production parameters and we're gonna do it by quartile. And we're gonna also start to compare the, Jeremy's talked about the 50th percentile or the, the group in the middle. We're gonna start delving in a little bit, looking at the top percentiles. Uh, you know, everybody, nobody wants to be average. So we, let's start challenging to see what we could do if we were a little bit above average. Um, and really what we're gonna ask you to do as we're going through this, any producers in the group, kind of look at your numbers and how, how where does your herd sit on this chart? So here's a chart and, and don't get too worried about the numbers here at this point. We're gonna, we're gonna expand this or explode it up a little bit later. But this, this slide looks at fat, milk, 305 milk and milk value by quartile. You can see the quartile is down on the left. So the 50th percentile would be kind of the median herds where you are in the middle. And then the 75th percentile, that's at top 25th percent of the herds. And the 90th percentile, that's at top 10% of the herds. So just keep that in mind as, as we go through here. We, we've had difficulty in the past trying to present benchmarks for production. We've often had to rely on, on American data or sometimes uh, university studies. This data we're presenting right now, it's 100% Canadian data from Canadian cows. And if you milk cows and you're on DHI, your numbers are in this data set. So you know, you're, thank, you, thank you for all the producers for, for being on DHI and being able to, that we can allow us to produce these numbers and give them back to you. I think this chart goes a long way towards helping producers uh, know where they stand and ideally to improve their herd to be in the, in the top quartiles or the top 10% of the herds in Ontario. So again, we looked here at milk, fat, 305 and milk value. The back page of this report is also looking at 305 uh, mature equivalent and also peak milk and uh, week four milk. Um, so this, this chart, uh, this, is a, this is a blow up uh, comparing Ontario to Canada and Ontario you know, charts very well with, with Canada. Uh, our challenge to producers and advisors is to look at where your herd numbers are compared to the 50th percentile. Are you there or are you, you know, half the herds in Ontario are above this number, half the herds are below. So uh, 30, 32.8 liters is midway in milk production and 1.29 kilograms of fat per cow per day is midway. And so it's just, just gives you an idea like of basically where, where you stand. Next slide. Here we go. Many, many advisors wanted benchmarks for peak milk. Uh, I'll show you a little bit later how peak milk help, helps predict the overall lactation production. Uh, also in this chart, we can look at 305 uh, mature equivalent and linear score um, is also presented. Week four milk is a, is a dairy comp function and the data was only available to us from Ontario herds and West. Week four milk is different than peak, but we've had requests from some advisors. Uh, they're using this number as an early predictor of, or er, early indicator, I guess, of how the lactation is starting. So, and we'll come back and we'll talk, we'll have a little section on week four milk at the end, but a bit of a teaser that, uh, you know, we, we, this is not a number we've had before. It's new and uh, we're all learning a little bit about it, but it, it does look pretty interesting.
many of the graphs we're presenting were basically developed in response to questions we had from producers or advisors over the, over the past year or so. Uh, and one of these questions was, how much difference in production should I expect between parities? And we're looking at the 50th percentile, so we're looking at midway here. But at the 50th percentile in Ontario, this difference is about 1,600 kilograms between lactation one and lactation two, and a further 650 kilograms between lactation two and those in, in three plus or more. This is a different number than what we're used to, what we're used to thinking of in the past. And I think it just goes to show that heifers today are different than they were even a few years ago. We'll come back and examine the, the top 25th percentile of, of the herds and look at the difference between parities. And this, this, these numbers are even more dramatic. And we'll give you some benchmarks a bit later on about that. But at the 50th percentile, we're looking at a 1600 kilogram spread and a 650 kilogram spread. Having a, a good transition period and achieving a high peak translates into more kilograms of milk during the lactation. We've often been told that. And when I was uh, just a, a baby vet, uh, I think the word, the, the numbers were, I think early on, I'm, I'm getting to be quite an old vet now, but I think early on we talked, well, maybe 200 kilograms of milk per, or 305 milk per kilogram of peak. I think I, later on that number got up to about 220. Well, now, you know, with the light, latest data from 2020, it looks like an average of 285 kilograms of 305 milk during the lactation per kilogram of peak. Peak is important. And the earlier we get that peak uh, and the higher that peak is on a cow basis, the better that lactation is going to be for the cow. Uh, there's a pause here. I, I'm trying to control Jeremy's computer. And uh, when to the time I press my, my mouse and the time the, the screen comes up, there's a bit of a lag there. So, so I apologize for that, but it was the best way we could do from uh, have two presenters doing it at the same time. Um, we also want to look at the impact of, of milk frequency on, on uh, daily production. And the common rule of thumb that we've been told is that we should expect an increase of 15% more milk if we go from a 2x milking to a 3x milking. We can see that the trend is about 17% in this case uh, when we go for, uh, this is based on 6,800 Canadian herds. Um, and herds uh, milking in AMS systems are seeing a, a, a milk bonus of about 11% when compared back to the uh, 2x milking. And this is where we want to start challenging. Whoops. Cancel. Jeremy, sorry, can you go back one? Thank you. If we, if we now start to challenge herds to be in the top 25th percentile, of production, the over, overall daily milk production increases. Uh, you can see that the overall numbers increase from where they were uh, in the 50 percentile, but the relationship stays roughly the same at about 9% for AMS and 15% for 3X. If we zero in on Ontario herds right now, um, you know, basically I'd say the Ontario herds fare a little bit better than the Canadian average. Uh, we're about 12% increase for AMS and up to 19% uh, when we look at 3x compared to 2x. And again, if we challenge us to looking at what happens when we look at a uh, 70, the top 25% of the herds, uh, we're up to 9 and 17%. So, so certainly, and I think the industry knows this, but again, we've always relied on other people to tell us, you know, what that, what we should expect if we make this management change. And, and now we've got you know, our Canadian herds uh, telling us some pretty, pretty significant numbers. So we're quite pleased about that. The last thing I wanna look at is by uh, parity. And the interesting thing here is that, I, that the numbers on the left are the top 75th percentile. They're exactly the same numbers that we looked at earlier when I looked at the, uh, the herd basis, but now I've split that herd into parity one, lactation two, lactation three. And I want to compare the, the production from lactation one animals to those of the herd. And so 
we'd expect kind of an equal increase in, in production from going from 2x to 3x to, to uh, or 2x to robotics to uh, 3x. But in, in this case, it seems that first calf heifers have maybe a bit of an added bonus, almost up to a 1% increase in production over the herd. So, and farmers do tell us that, you know, when cows, heifers are milked more frequent, frequently, we do tend to see, it seems to be easier on the heifers. They seem to do better. Their udders are, are fuller and, and ideally that they milk more. So I think this is bearing this out that we are seeing uh, a bit of a, a, a bonus uh, if we can milk heifers more frequently. Ontario, we're seeing the same the same pattern here. Uh, again, about that one percent bonus, and I think some farmers would think maybe it's more than one percent. But again, this is based on uh, in Ontario twenty thousand different tests. So I think it bears out that you know there is a bonus, and it's in that one percent range. Jeremy, I think it's over to you. Okay. So thanks, Ian. That was a great great job of describing you know some of the the uh, key metrics that we've we've uncovered for Ontario for 2020. So now here's a bit of a different approach. Um, I think it's, it's kind of an interesting way of looking at the data. It describes a herd with different metrics instead of just looking at each metric to itself. Okay, so, um, you know, up till now, you know, we looked at these production parameters individually. We've done some comparisons at the average from 2019 to 2020. But now we're going to group herds together ranked by their 305 milk, okay? So all the 6,800 herds for Canada, for example, we've ranked, we put them in order of highest 305 milk to lowest, and then we've grouped those herds into quartiles. So we got, and, and, and deciles, so we got the top 10% of herds, we got the top 25% of herds, uh, 50%, the top 50%, the bottom 25%. And we've done some comparisons to 2019 as well. Um, but certainly, and it was, it, the, the comparisons were very similar, whether we looked at 2020 data or, or 2019, but here would be how we would describe top 10% of, of herds or top 25% of herds, if we're gonna look to challenge you, these are the metrics we would expect on average for those herds in those groups. So for a top 10% herd in Canada, for example, on average, those herds are at 39 kilos of milk per day. They're at almost 1.5 kilos of fat per day, you know, just over 13,000 kilos of milk per day, uh, sorry, 13,000 kilos of 305 milk. Peak milk is almost 50 kilos and so on, okay? So, <clears throat> But for each of those groups of ranked herds, there is a range around those numbers. And I'll, we'll, I'll explain that to you in a few slides. Um, uh, and you'll, I, I think, understand more clearly what, how I, what I mean by that. So, so that was Canadian herds we just looked at. And if you look at these numbers, they're very similar for Ontario herds. So again, there's, you know, just, around 2,360 herds, thereabouts. They're ranked, all of them, from top 305 milk average herd to the bottom. And then they're, they're grouped together in, in deciles and quartiles. So the top 10% of, of Ontario herds as they're ranked by 305 herd milk. Okay, so those herds would have a 39 and a half kilo per cow per day average. They don't have almost 1.5 kilos of fat per day you know, peak milks at 50 kilos and so on and so on across the row. Similarly, for the top 25% of herds in Ontario, as it's ranked by 305 milk, you know, almost 38 kilos of milk per cow per day, 1.42 kilos of fat per day, you know, 12,360 some kilos of uh, 305 milk for lactation, peak milk 47.6 and so on. So, and again, just like with the Canadian rankings and, and the characteristics for Canadian herds, it's the same for Ontario herds where there's a rank, range around those numbers, but it's kind of, it's much easier to talk about the numbers when you have a number instead of, well, this is a range for this and this is a range for that. And so if you look at all the herds in Canada, so this is what's called a box and whiskers plot. And it kind of, it shows you the distribution of the data 
for each quartile, okay? So on the left-hand side of this graph, it, the graph looks busy, I will, I will say a little bit. But if you look, there's four distinct chunks of boxes and, and graphing here, we'll say. And the top quartile or the top 25% of the herds is on the left-hand side of this plot. And there's four distinct bars there, and that's for different regions. So Canada's the left bar, uh, uh, Ontario West is the second bar, Ontario's the third bar, and Western Canada is the fourth bar within each of those quartiles. So you can see the range here, that, that block of bar is the, is the range where most of the values are captured. So although the average for Canadian herds is in the top 25% is, is 37 and a half kilos per cow per day, it ranges just over 35 to all, you know, about 39, right? And then the, you know, what I, and you read these quartile sections the same, it's the similar, it's the, the explanation around it is the same. <clears throat> so not only is, is there some variation within each quartile, what I also find interesting is the difference between the top quartile and the bottom. Right? There's a 12 kilo difference. So the management factors that go into managing herds in the top quartile versus the bottom quartile will have an influence of 12 kilos of milk difference. So that's, to me, that's significant. It's a bit, so management certainly will have a big impact on that. And, and, and that's uh, things that all of you would have control over in, in many ways, of course. Similarly for fat per cow per day, and if you remember for the, the Canadian herds, it was right around that 1.5 kilos of butter fat per cow per day, but there is a range within each quartile, right? And again, so you can see the variation within the top 25%, for example, if that's the, the group of bars on the left-hand side, but then looking from the top herds versus the bottom herds, you know, almost a half a kilo of butterfat per cow per day difference. That's significant. So all that effort going into making milk, making fat per cow per day on farm, you know, the work that's being done can have a huge impact on, on what your cows are going to be producing. And obviously there's genetics that come into that and there's other things. It's not just the, the work and the management day to day that impacts this, but, um, I think everyone understands and gets the drift, uh, gets the gets the point. So, so you know, another you know, looking at or focusing some attention with this slide here, and these are Canadian herds in the top ten or twenty five percent. You know, looking at parity and how that parity is impacting three or lactation group is impacting three hundred five milk and milk value, huge. Um, significant differences. And I think it's, it's not necessarily what we've always been told or taught or anecdotally, you know, yeah, it's all, it's usually about a thousand between each lactation group. And Ewan was mentioning this earlier, but this, this, these numbers would show it's, it's quite a bit different than that. Um, and especially when you go from lactation one to lactation two, it's, a, it's, it's another thousand kilos on top of that roughly, you know, so huge difference. And uh, certainly it lends itself to considering, you know, the issue with having lots of replacement on hand and a lot of the genetic strategies and, and, and strategy, repro strategies used on farm. There's lots of heifers um, that are available. You know, what's the balance between getting these super awesome first lactation animals milking in the, in the milking string and, you know, discarding or culling out those older cows? You know, there's a balancing act there. Right. And, you know, looking at milk value and, and, and more of a representation of money in your pocket. Right. Those mature cows, um, you get in the lactation three plus, they're going to be like at that $2,000 mark more uh, than the first lactation animals on, on farm. So, you know, those, these numbers, I think, are accentuated in the top herds compared to the 50th percentile herd numbers that uh, Ewan was showing earlier. You know, and in Ontario, so those are Canadian herds. 
And for the top 10%, which is the top block here, top 25% is the bottom block here for Ontario herds now, you know, the pattern is, is very similar. So Ontario is no different than Canada as a whole. And those spreads are, are, are you know, uh, very, very similar. So again, we, we were thinking 1,000 kilos between lactation groups. That might not be totally the case. And I, I think these numbers bear it out that it's, it, it maybe isn't uh, anymore. So, um, so Ewan, I'll let you uh, take over here. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I promised that I'd circle back to the, the, the this concept of the weak interval milk. Uh, in fact, we can look at weak interval milk at really any stage of lactation. In, in this example, we, we chose to look at it at week four, week eight, and week 12. Uh, weak interval milk compares each cow at the same time in her lactation. It's a different concept than we're used to seeing. It's a dairy comp uh, function. Peak milk is different. Uh, Peak milk is, is the point of the highest product productivity for a cow, but that, that peak milk can occur uh, really at any time. It can, some cows will peak at 40 days, some will peak at 50, some at 60, some even later. So an advantage of looking at week four milk is that it may be occurring up to a month before peak occurs. And can, we can therefore maybe have an earlier indicator of future performance. The disadvantage of peak or week four milk is that it's early on in the lactation and the accuracy of the prediction may come into question. For example, if we wait to get a, a week 12 milk value, uh, the, the milk weight may be very accurate, but by this time, it's probably too late to intervene if, if problems are occurring. So if I look at a graph of strictly weak milk and we can, or weak four milk and we can do this, and this is for the top 25th percentile of the Hertz in, in uh, uh, I guess Canada here. Um, we uh, yes, this is all the herds. I guess so. The all is uh, all Canadian herds from Ontario west. The red bar is Ontario only, and the west is Ontario or Western provinces. So, as we would expect, uh, there's a difference in week four milk between parities, and it, fall it basically follows the pattern that Jeremy just talked about in the 305 milk trend. And that the biggest difference in week four milk seems to be occurring between lactation one and, la and the later lactations. For week, the week eight graph, the production bars are higher, but the trends between parities are the same. In this case, we've got uh, lactation three animals with week four milks over 50 kilos. Looking at week 12 now, so basically we're out, out three months from the start of the lactation. And we see that the week, the lactation three animals, that uh, they're, not, they're not achieving that 50 kilograms anymore. So it seems like the week eight was at the highest, which coincides roughly with when peak would occur. Um, so again, week 12 has the same pattern, but now we start to see production decreasing and almost starting to look similar to what happened at, at week four. And so people are saying, well, wait a minute, can we, can we use, even though week four is not that accurate because we don't have that many numbers, can we use, and since week four and week 12 are, look fairly similar, could we use week four milk as a, as a way to get an early look and to see how this lactation is going? In the previous three slides, we looked at, at patterns of week four, week eight, and week 12 milk for the top 25th percentile of the herds. This slide ranks the herds by quartiles, but regardless of production, weak interval milk seems to follow the same trend. So we always we see that peak about week, uh, week eight, and the week four and the week 12 milks are similar. Always week 12 seems to be a bit higher, but, but there is a strong correlation there. Uh, I really like this, this graph. I think it kind of tells the story this is Ontario herds, 1,560 Ontario herds with uh, week, week um, four, eight, and 12 milk. And now we're graphing it. And it, it does show that week eight milk is the highest, which we, which we would expect. But especially for lactation two and lactation three cows, week four milk really does correlate well with week 12 milk. Uh, and it, doesn't, it does not do that as well for first calf heifers. They tend to flatten out after week eight, and which again we expect heifers tend to be have a, a, a flatter lactation curve. So that's not a surprise to us. But 
it, it is some advisors are looking at this and saying, you know, is there is there something we can do here to uh, maybe capture these cow, cattle a little bit earlier than what we're used to doing. And Jeremy, I think you can, you're up again. Okay. Thanks, Yuan. And uh, yeah, I find uh, lots of advisors are looking at these weak interval milk numbers to help maybe uh, describe uh, a little bit sooner and maybe a little bit more detail uh, what's happening in early lactation. So. So now we've talked about a whole bunch of numbers up until now, and these are related to all herds in Canada or in Ontario or in West or you know wherever, but what about your numbers? And how can I make sense of what I just saw through comparing what I'm doing? And you know, how do you fit? And where do I find this information? And for all of you that are using dairy comp on farm or for if there's advisors on the on the in the meeting here today and looking at your client data. You know there's there's lots of easy reports that you can call up to find these numbers to compare, you know, to 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 make some comparisons and 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 you know validate that you're doing an awesome job. Um, hopefully for all of you, that is the case and maybe it's a motivator for some to get even better. So, and here's a milk per cow per day. And this is for herds that are on a milk recording plan. And these are all the test dates for the last year. And it's this command that's in the title slide. So for those of you that love typing, um, you could type that on the command line. And if you're like me, that's probably not the route you'd prefer to take. There's also on your lookout bar in Dairy Comp, there's a graphs icon there and you need to find this command, YRABG1 and it'll bring up this exact report, okay? And you can see, you know, right, that's by lactation group, it gives you the numbers, um, it gives you herd average in the bottom block. And you're saying, well, what's the lookout bar? Maybe some of you will, you know, typing on the command line, what, is, what are you saying exactly? You can click on graphs to look at trends if you're in the display window, so all these different things. So here's a bit of dairy comp navigation as a review for, for all of you, I'm sure. But just as a reminder, right, the command line, when we say command line, it's that command question mark where you can type things. And I'm just going to, sorry for, hopefully no one's going to, I'm not trying to make anyone dizzy, but just to move back. So that command in the title bar, that plot milk for lactation greater than zero, so on and so forth, that's what you could type on the command question mark line. And that would generate this report. The lookout bar is circled in red, and there's that graphs icon that you could click on. This report, YRAVG1, would be in there, and you can just click on it off the list. And then there's a graph tab along the bottom in your Dairy Comp display window. And if we were in Dairy Comp and we clicked on the graph tab, it would show these numbers in graph form. Okay, so that's a bit of the navigation that I refer to over the next few slides. You know, so here's a command that's not a default in your system. You may have it created, but it's not a default. So I'm gonna guess that a lot of you won't have something like this, but again, it can summarize fat per cow per day by test date for your farm. And by default, it goes back a year. Obviously you'll need to be on a sampling program with DHI to get these numbers in dairy comp, okay? Um, similarly, all these reports are kind of built the same. It's just using a different parameter within the presentation. So here is, 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 is the same type of report, but using 305 mil by lactation group, and then the herd average in the bottom block of numbers, right? And, and again, you could type that command as, as before, right on the command question mark line and, and, and get the report. You can go into that lookout bar click on the graphs icon and then scroll through to find YRABG2. And that'll be a default for all of you. All of you will have this in your, in your dairy comp uh, if you go looking for it, uh, I'm confident of that. One of the, so here's one that maybe isn't, um, a de, isn't a default, but again, you can type this command on the command line if you wish, if this is of, of interest or importance to you, but I think it's important to, to just to show, you know, how do we make use of the, this mature equivalent business? And again, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, mature equivalent allows you to compare apples to apples. 
one lactation group to the next. And within this herd, the lactation one group, all things being equal, meaning age, lactation number, season of calving and so on and so forth, the lactation group one cows are doing the worst in this herd, which is pro probably atypical, right? So this is a within herd benchmark. So it's one thing to benchmark with other herds, you can do within herd benchmarking, so to speak, by using tools like this, okay? Again, in order to get the numbers to compare to some of the things that we've talked about earlier, you know, sometimes there's some of these things aren't default. And this is another command, not by default. Certainly dairy comp support can help by making it a command that's easily accessible in your dairy comp. You can type the command in the, in the title bar to find it. But again, finding your, your interval milk numbers, your peak milk numbers, your milk value by, by, by lactation group for your farm. You know, one of the things I will mention, and it's because you may type that command and when you go to your office computer and say, hey, why can't I get, I'm getting an error here. It's not generating this report. And these, these interval milk numbers may not be deep, may not be created in your dairy comp. Um, please take advantage of the support group and the support line. Uh, there's a whole bunch of very smart and helpful people and they're, they're eager to do good customer service and we'll be more than happy to help you create some of these things if that's of great interest to you and, and hopefully it is. Um, and then linear score by parity again, another way to compare, hey, is utter health compare favorably to my peers to top 10%, 25% herds. And again, um, looking in that lookout bar and finding why are ABG3 will give you this type of report. You can type the command on the command line. So hopefully that gives you the options and the ideas to find the numbers that would allow you to compare to the information that we've uh, presented to you today. So. I'll let you uh, sort of take us home here, Ewan. Oops, sorry. Oops, yeah, that's my fault. Uh, so this, basically we're coming down to the take home at this point, you know, what have we learned? And we've, uh, we collected a lot of data and uh, we still have lots that we have to sift our way through yet, but this, this portion was on production. So our, our goal was to kind of create some benchmarks and, and some, uh, some take homes for you to compare your herds to to what the industry is doing. So, so some of the take homes we basically saw that uh, production largely decreased from in 2020 compared to 2019, and th this is okay. I mean, there's ups and downs from year to year. There's changes, but we we're quite excited that rather than just having one year's worth of data, now we have two years worth of data. In fact, we had a we have 130,000 test days between the two years, and the fact that the data was so close from one year to the other really gave us confidence that you know we're looking at the at the right data. We, you know we collected the right numbers, and we're spewing out the right the right uh, information. So so that that was really positive. You know we we don't want to see big changes. Had we done that, we might have said, well maybe we didn't uh, push the right button or didn't you know ask for the right, ask the right question. So we're pretty happy that this validates what we've got. Uh, Point number two, production does matter. There's a big difference here in, across Canada. The median of Canadian herds produced 32.1 liters of milk per day and 1.28 kilograms of butter fat. The top herds in Canada produce almost five, more than five liters more milk per cow per day and about point, uh, what's that, about 0.14 more kilograms of butter fat per day. So it's a big difference and that difference is dollars. That's uh, a lot of dollars. So I think we're pretty happy to show some benchmarks and some guidelines and, and hopefully some targets to, to try to achieve. Another observation is Western herds have, best, have the best production. And this is not new. We've seen this year after year after year. The, uh, I don't know what's happening out, out West, uh, particularly BC, but they seem to uh, be you know, ahead of the game. Um, a lot of their herds seem to be in the, certainly in the top 25th and even some in the top 10th. And, and not that we don't have those herds in Ontario, they just seem to have more of them. Um, the data for the Canadian herd shows, that, and this is my peak 
comment, but we're seeing a, a 285 kilograms more 305 milk for every kilogram of peak that we can achieve in early lactation. So this is, this is tremendous and, and it shows the importance of getting off to a really good start. We've seen that milking frequency increases daily production. And if I use two twice a day her milk herds as the base, AMS herds produce on a range of eight to 12% more than those two X herds. And three X herds uh, produce 15 to 19% more than two X herds. And this, this kind of matches the industry's uh, quotes of around 15. So um, maybe we're exceeding the industry quote a little bit. Heifers milk more frequently, produce more milk. I, I talked a little bit about this and there's approximately a 1% advantage in daily milk production when we compare heifers milk more frequently to the herd that's milk more frequently. And some of you may say, well, yeah, but you know, heifers don't milk as high, but they, they milk longer. Well, if we looked at the 305 milk over that same period, we saw that same 1% advantage in milk production. So, so that's, that seems to be where we're, where we're at for, you know, it's a good thing. Heifers like to be milked more often. If we look at the 305 milk production for the, for the top 25th percent of the herds, what do we see? Well, you know, we talked earlier that we used to think that the, the spread between lactation one and two, or sorry, lactation one and two, and then between two and three plus was a thousand in each, in each, uh, in, in the middle between each uh, parity. Well, that number, especially if we look at the, the top 75th percent of the herds, or the, well, the top, sorry, the 25th, the very best herds, we're seeing that number now, it's not a thousand, but it's 2,100 kilograms and another 20, or another 700 kilograms from lactation two to mature. So 21 and 700 is almost 3,000 kilograms. So if we used to expect a thousand and a thousand, that added up to 2,000, well, now we're almost getting an extra thousand between a first lactation animal and a mature cow. So, so our heifers and our herds have changed uh, and we're getting a lot of the early milk up front, which is, which is great. But there are key differences for the top 10% of percentile of the herds. So we saw that the, the very best herds were achieving almost a 50 kilograms a peak. And, and that 50 kilograms a peak is about seven and a half kilograms more than the average herd in Ontario. So that's, that's pretty phenomenal. Uh, those same herds produce 2000 kilograms more during the, during the 305 period than those in the middle. So again, the top herds are, are doing a tremendous job. The top 10% of the herds also had almost $1,600 more milk revenue per cow than the 50th percentile herds. So that's, that's, that's a lot of money and that's, for every cow that's uh, milking per year. So, you know, we do the math on a 50 cow herd, 100 cow herd, 200 cow herd, that adds up to a lot of money. I find this very interesting. The, the very top herds have better udder health. And I think a lot of people think, well, you know, the cows are milking hard, there's under more stress. Uh, they're more vulnerable to getting udder health problems or mastitis. And the, the better linear scores uh, these cows that have the best milk also seem to have the best uh, udder health scores. So, uh, so I think that just talks to management that, you know, the good managers are managing to get extra milk and also managing to, to uh, keep udder health in check. I think that same management translates into the MUNs, the milk, urea, nitrogen. And we use MUNs as a way to basically confirming how good we're feeding cows, what the rumen health is like. And it, it you know, the MUNs for the very best herds are really the same or in some cases lower than the herds at the 50th, 50th percentile. So again, good management is feeding these cows properly and it looks like these herds are doing that. The top 25th percent of the herds produce 12 kilograms more milk than the bottom quartile. So now I'm comparing the top 25th to the bottom 25th. And, and that's, that's the, uh, the whisker box plot that uh, Jeremy showed earlier, the quartiles. So that's quite a bit of milk. And, the same, the same comparison, about a half a kilogram more butter fat. So there's a big spread between the best herds and the, the uh, less than average herds, I would say. And the last thing is the, the on the, the uh, uh, so, sorry, wait, I'm just looking at your pop up here. I'll, I'll come back to that later. Uh, the, the most interesting thing I think that, that I've seen in this is 
you know, this whole concept of the weak interval milk, it, it is unique to Dairy Comp. Um, Dairy Comp makes an internal lactation curve that provides a very early preview into future milk production. And advisors have asked us for this and we're getting requests for this. And I think it's something that we're just on the very tip of and learning a bit more about it. But um, we do know week 12 milk is accurate. It has lots of observations, but because week four milk is so closely correlated, uh, I think we can maybe make use of looking at week four milk and, and predicting what might happen later. Uh, we often see that the week four milk is just about a kilogram and a half less than what we saw, see at week 12. And in Western provinces, and now again, production is higher out there as a rule, but that one and a half seems to be more like 1.7 or two kilograms um, less milk in week 12 than, than we saw in, in uh, Ontario. So a bit more of a spread in the Western provinces, but the same trend. I just wanna finish up with, with two slides about ketosis. Um, ketosis is maybe the, one of the first jobs I, uh, or keto, keto screen, and we used to call it now the keto lab. One of the first jobs I, I think I had with uh, DHI uh, four or five years ago was talking about ketosis. And, and at that time, we, we would see uh, this, the, well, I'll put this back up. The red bar across here is where we don't wanna be over. If we have herds that have more than 20% incidence of ketosis, then we consider that that's a, a major herd problem. And when we looked at this five, six years ago, uh, in almost in every region, we, you know, we, we were over that bar. The herds had a big ketosis problem. So if you look at this now, and you know, there's a bit of a sneak over 20% for all of Canada, but Ontario and the West and Ontario by itself for the Western provinces by himself, are really under 20%. So you might be sitting there thinking, well, we don't have a ketosis problem anymore, you know, problem solved. I like this graph because it shows that with a lot of effort and, and surveillance, farmers have embraced the keto lab uh, program and have tested their cows. We've got 250,000 samples on this in this one year, tested their cows and they're taking proaction to try to, to prevent ketosis. So it looks like the efforts have worked a lot. But this next slide shows, and this is Ontario, and I could show this for the West or you know, all of Canada, it doesn't matter. But if I, if I now look at the percentiles, and I've got the 305 milk at the bottom, so the very uh, lowest producing herds on the left and the highest producing herds on the right. And in the middle, and to the, from the five to the, to the one on the left, that's basically saying that half the herds in Ontario uh, still have ketosis in their herds in excess of 20%. So there's still lots of work to be done. I guess the good message here is that the very high producing herds have managed to, you know, find ketosis and, you know, treat these, find it early, treat these cows aggressively and, uh, you know, basically um, keep their herd in, in check with ketosis. So very positive message, but there's still lots of work to be done and lots of testing that needs to uh, needs to be continued. But this, those last two slides that you and where he spoke about this keto lab and some of the results we've been finding, that's just the tip of the iceberg as it relates to all kinds of other metrics as it relates to reproduction, transition. And we're, you know, we're building more presentations like this to help describe top repro herds help describe what are good transition numbers as it relates to keto lab, as it relates to, um, you know, um, stillbirth rate, as it relates to some of those maybe early lactation fresh cow measures that, that all of you might be uh, viewing. So. Hello. Okay. So we had a couple people that would like to know what is the 50th percentile for MUN levels or what is ideal MUN? So I, I can answer that. Uh, I don't know if there's an ideal MUN. It depends on the herd. But if I look at some of the uh, charts that Jeremy presented, uh, the middle 50th percentile in Ontario. Should I go back, Ewan? Do you want me to go yeah. back? Yeah, it's the uh, production characteristics of Ontario oh. herds, Jeremy. Why is your internet so shit right now? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> um, the middle was 11.3. So, um, yeah, so in... In that range is uh, is certainly quite fine. No, 
Sorry. Yeah, Jeremy, it's, it's later. It's where the production characteristics are. Yeah, that's what I thought. Sorry. Yep. My mistake. Right there. Yeah. That's Canada. Go to the next one. There yeah, 11.3, 11, 11 Kevin. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it seems everybody's worried about what that number should be. And, you know, there's a range. And, you know, I don't get too upset if herds are um, eight, nine. Uh, depends on how, you know, if a herd's really milking well, an eight's just fine. If it's not milking so well, then I think, yeah, maybe we should look at that. Um, I get worried when I get much over 12 or 13. So there is there is a range there. There's I think the sweet spot is in that probably nine to eleven, but uh, eight to twelve is certainly acceptable. Is that fair? Okay. And to kind of continue on that subject, um, I've got a question from Ron, and he would like to know: Does MUN drop later in lactation, or should it be eleven all throughout the lactation? Yeah, good question. Uh, we tend to see that number um, stay fairly flat. Um, it does maybe depend, depends a whole lot on how you feed. So in the old component type fed herds and, and maybe now with some of the uh, robotics, we do tend to see maybe a little bit higher MUNs in the early part of the lactation and it tails off. But with TMRs, we tend to see it fairly flat. Um, and again, I want to I want to stay within those those uh, those ranges. So, you know, maybe maybe at the front end it's at eleven, but at the back end maybe it's down to nine. But still, I'm within my range of of eight to twelve, so I, I don't worry. Uh, and the other thing I don't worry about is, you know, you have a if you get the DHI graph and you see every cow there, you're always going to have a cow up at around twenty or twenty two or whatever, some crazy high number. And if there's only one up there, I don't worry about her. If they're all up there, I really worry about that. So, so basically, those are the outliers. Try, don't ignore the outliers. It's a herd test. Look at look at it on a herd basis. Thank you. I have our next question is anonymous, but we would like to know for the highest sustained herd average production, what we aim for in terms of percentage of animals in each parity. <laughs> well, we, we <laughs> asked that question yesterday, and we don't have an answer for that, but we're going to try and get an answer for that, because it's, I think it's an important question with, with the situation we're in now with, uh, you know, quota and uh, lots of heifers on the, on the farm. But I will say that when you look at Jeremy's numbers and the spread, um, just go back a couple, Jeremy, uh, to the characteristics. Or that's, I'm looking at the milk Sorry. value. Yeah, look, yeah. One. Here, if, if you look at that, you know, it, it only makes sense that we try to keep as many mature cows. And Jeremy talked about the balance. Like, you want to have that old old uh, cow leave before she gets crippled or gets mastitis or whatever. But but there is value in having that cow in the herd. Uh, so I don't have a definitive answer. But anecdotally, when I first started looking at DHI records. Uh, fairly seriously back in the early 90s, I guess, I'd say the spread was about 50% heifers, 20% second lactation, and, and sorry, 30, sorry, got that backwards, 30% heifers, 20% uh, second, and maybe up to 50% mature cows. And I don't know, I don't know if we have that average number now, but anecdotally, that number seems to have shifted. You know, we see lots of herds with 40, 45% heifers, uh, 15 to 20 seconds, and down to you know 35, 40 mature cows. So it has changed, but it's a good question, and we will try to get an answer because yeah. I that's that's on our that's on our radar. Thanks for the question. It's a great question. Perfect. Thank you. Our next question: uh, We would like to, if we can go back to the slide that had the command line. Um, command for the average fat production per test. Yep. So those numbers will be handy to reference later if, if you need, so. Okay, so next question comes from Nick Rangley. Why does it seem that our butter fat from DHI is so much lower than our tank average from DFO? 
the, the, the calculation is a little different. So the way DFO calculates it uh, will be a little different than how DHI calculates it. So there's going to be a small difference. I think it's point, I think it's point one or point. It's a small difference anyway. So the, the numbers will very rarely, if ever, equal exact for that reason alone to me. And then it, it comes into sampling procedures. It, it, it comes down to, you know, especially if it's a tie stall herd, you know, when cows are fed and the, 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 um, yeah. So there's a number of different factors that go into that and time of milking. So if you're only taking one sample and you're taking a night milking versus a morning milking or an afternoon milking, that's gonna have an impact as well. And um, so, yeah, I, this part of it, you know, the regional managers are, are usually, or not usually, they are well equipped to, to, to sort some of those things out and, and, and rectify any issues, uh, test day related issues that might impact that. So. Um, certainly if that is a, a concern, I, I'm going to suggest to, to raise it. Um, and even if you raise it with, you know, you can send, send the concern to DC at lactinet.ca and, and we can certainly forward on, uh, to the appropriate people to, to help answer those, uh, questions and, 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 and hopefully rectify, uh, the discrepancies as, as best we can. So next question is, does ketosis percentage rate change by parity? Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the more mature cows uh, will always have, uh, we always see more ketosis there. And one of the slides I didn't show you because we're, we're trying to hold some off because we, we're going to have a ketosis talk and transition cow talk later on. But uh, that 20% bar that I had on, on, a, on one of the slides, that in, in most regions, uh, in most reg regions, it doesn't matter if you're in BC or, or Ontario or whatever, the mature cows often are above that bar. Uh, not so, first calf heifers are the least, second a bit more, and mature cows, we, we tend to see them quite often, uh, well above the 20, sometimes approaching 25 and 30% of the herd. So um, there's still lots of work to be done with the mature cows. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any more questions at the moment. If anyone else has got something, put it in Ta now. Tanya, I did see a question that, that I didn't answer from uh, Wade about what, what a linear score is. Oh, yes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy, can you bring up a slide with linear score on it? Uh, yeah. Um, this would really be the only one. Production, we have a production, well, that's fine. Um, so Wade, the linear score, it's a tricky thing to, it's correlated strongly with, with some XL count. Most people are very used to looking at some, X, some XL count and it's a number that we're used to seeing. The only reason we would use a linear score is there's only two reasons we, we would use a linear score. And one is to put a dollar amount to milk production loss. And there's, that's another talk again, but um, there's lots of research showing that if a linear score uh, is over, uh, three, for example, there's a certain amount of, of milk production dollar loss for those cows. We can't put a dollar figure to a high SMAC cell count. We can with linear score. So, so it's kind of something that maybe the academics would use a bit more uh, to create a dollar loss for you. Where I think we use, the other reason we use it, if you're looking at a herd, and, and Jeremy's brought this, this slide up, if that number on the very right with all the boxes over it, if that number is over a three, that tells me if I'm looking at your herd and uh, trying to investigate maybe another health problem, if I see that number is over three, that tells me that I've got a herd problem. It's not a cow problem, it's a herd problem. And as long as, I, so you might have 10 mastitis going on in your herd and you might think, boy, I got a, I got a terrible problem. But again, depending on the number of cows you've got, and what your linear score is, that'll tell me if I should focus, it's kind of like a decision tree, but it tells me if I should focus my efforts on looking at individual cow problems, or I should focus my efforts on looking at a herd problem. So in this case, Jeremy's got up here, if you had individual cows with high snack cell counts and, and dying with mastitis, I would say we've got a, a cow problem and I would 
focus my efforts towards individual cow uh, management not, and not their herd management. I think we'll wrap this up here, Tanya and Ewan, I think. Yep. And, you know, again, I'll just remind everyone if, if for people on the line still, if you would like a, a copy of the, of the presentation or we could send you a copy of the numbers, uh, the, the, some of the benchmark numbers, we're, we're more than happy to email them to you. Um, you know, email dc at lactinet.ca. Um, if you have any questions about test day, because there's someone raised that, like please send that in because we'd like to rectify them. That's the, but if we don't know that there are issues, it's hard for us to help. So please send that in if, if, if that applies to you. And um, again, we'll th thank you for, for participating, attending today's webinar. Hopefully there was some information that was helpful for your farm, for your dairy.